Hola, bona nit. Aquí estem amb Burham Somes. Molt contenta que hagis pogut venir, Burham, per poder-te presentar com un amic i com un gran escriptor que admiro aquí al públic de Barcelona. Abans de començar, donar també agraïments a la casa que ens acull, al Centre de Cultura Contemporània de Barcelona i, evidentment, també al PEN català, que juntament amb Biblioteques de Barcelona ha fet possible aquest acte. Us recordo que teniu traducció simultània, suposo que ja teniu els aparells. Jo, a partir d'aquí, començaré a parlar amb anglès perquè Burham pugui seguir. I will now start speaking with you in English. Uh, I just said I'm so happy that you are here with us, that, that I can present you to the public and readers from Barcelona as a friend and as a great writer that I really admire. Uh, we will be talking today about your work uh, and also about your activism in, in the organization that's called International Pen, Pen International. Uh, so, uh, Welcome to Barcelona. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I thought that we could start directly with your book, with the, your last book, Labyrinth. Uh, if I remember well, it was published first in Turkish in 2018. Then it was translated next year to, into English. And now I don't know how many uh, languages is translated, 40 or more, no? you said, uh, and also we have uh, the Catalan and uh, the Spanish translation that you are presented, uh, presenting here. Uh, 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 these are new books, no? Are you satisfied with that? Very much. Thank you very much uh, for organizing this event and inviting me and also, of course, uh, for making it available, my book in Spanish and in Catalan. Uh, around this time of this event. Thank you. In you? Oh. Just my papers. Uh, let's start with your book. You're, uh, uh, for me, you are a writer. Before everything, you are a writer. So I thought we could tr start with your book, speaking about your book. Uh, I will pose you questions, three questions about time and three questions about space in Labyrinth. Why? Uh, here is a very well-known theory of Bakhtin about chronotrop. Uh, and uh, you, of course you know that Bakhtin says that if you want to innovate in literature, in narrations, you have to change a chronotrop. You have to change the way we perceive space and, uh, and time. And I believe that you made that, that that is what makes your work so interesting for us, because you help us understand the world in which we live. Something changed, it's not a realistic novel, not even modernist novel, but something different. Are you aware of that? Thank you very much. You know, uh, when Bakhtin was writing those texts, um, I don't know whether he read Einstein or not, because Einstein's physics changed um, our view of time and space. Before Einstein, time and space were two different things. But since relativity, they are single and same thing. But what about art? In art, can we say that they are the same thing? And Bakhtin started, and he himself started to invent his own words, vocabularies, terms like chronotope, you know. Mm -hmm. He said, if you use this word, that means you, are, you refer both of them at the same time. That's big uh, comfort for a writer. I don't mean when you are writing a novel. Mm -hmm. Comfort when you think about the time and space, you know, connecting each other and affecting each other. And also, especially in our age, when you would like to change the time, you should realize that at the same time you are changing the space too. They are not independent from each other. And it changes the whole structure and the whole story in the novel, not only in our daily life. So when I was writing this labyrinth, because it was about someone who lost his memory in Istanbul and wandering 
in streets, trying to remember his past. That means he is trying to catch up a time that he lost, the time of his past. But he is trying to find this time through the space. So uniting space and time in that novel uh, was kind of not aim. Uh, I can say the only destination that I could follow. Thank you. I will be insisting on all these questions. Let's start with the, your protagonist, Boratin. Uh, he's a musician. Yeah? And music, like, for example, football, demands full present, presence. So you can't go, you can't listen to the music and do something else. You, you go to the concert to be there, really, in presence, like we go to football game. Uh, and my, somehow I imagine that we all do this, we go to the show, because there does not exist, for that time being, there is no other reality than being there, being in full present. Uh, it's like time stops and it's coagulated. We are somewhere where the time doesn't go away. So we experience something like Kairos and we can escape from this success, uh, succession of Kronos, not all the time. And uh, this is like a need for the ritual which we don't have in our consumer society. But the rituals we become are only simulacra of what was eternity before. So is there a reflection about this pre full presence of being or the place and time together? Uh, in the fact that your protagonist is a musician and not a writer, for example. Uh, you know, uh, when you you were asking this question. Uh, I immediately remembered, you know, with Einstein, how he described the reality in this world. He said that there is no things in this world. We have facts. The world is the collection of the facts. Facts means activity, a real event. But for a novelist, this is not even enough. The fact is part of story, but mainly we play on the reflection of the fact in our memory or in our hearts, in our brain. How we describe these facts or things in our memory and heart, and then to represent, to draw a picture of this in a novel. That's why every novel or every writer is unique. No one can copy each other because the reflection of the things always different because the person, the reflector is a different person. So the thing that you reflect means that you are reflecting yourself. Uh, in the end, copying uh, another person, another creative artist, something impossible. If you try to do it, that means that you are destined to doom. I will insist a little bit on this notion of present, because in, your no, in this novel we are talking about labyrinth. Uh, the protagonist uh, lost his memory. He has no past. But in your uh, earlier novel, uh, Istanbul, Istanbul, we deal with people who are prisoners uh, in somehow without future. So uh, let, let me say that uh, in somehow we are always in catch in this present that is like eternal. We can't go away from it. But also, we don't see the reality in which we live. So uh, your novel, what I felt all the time, is that you are trying to show us that we should be more careful to see the things that lie beyond, uh, uh, in front of us, but we are not able to see them, although they are in the same time that we live. You know, uh, I think it's my, um, my disease or my illness, you know, always thinking about time. Um, they are not available in Spanish or Catalan. My first and second novel, they are mainly about the concept of time. How can we describe it? There are endless ways of describing time and feeling it. And uh, when we start to think and also to write about time, one of the questions always comes to us and we say that now the whole universe has about 
how many years? 14 billions, 14.8 billions years. The question, one of the questions that couldn't be answered yet, why is it at the moment our time? Not the time of our grand, you know, parents or our grandchildren, or one billion years ago. At the moment, we are exactly at the time of our lives. That's a big question. Maybe one of the theories says that the whole times of the universe being lived at the same time. So our time is endless, the start and the end. So when you write a novel behind a story, the story is secondary. Uh, you know, someone trying to commit suicide or someone being tortured or someone falling in love. This is something easy, you know, if we sit in a coffee shop, in 10 minutes we can create 20 stories to write. But the question is, what is the, the reflection behind the story, you know? When your protagonist walk in a street, what are you describing behind the scene? Whether he or she is walking in front of a ruined building or a blossoming tree or, you know, blue sky or in a rainy day, all this means the real atmosphere of the novel. That's something Tolstoy very much, you know, insisted. He said that the whole novel is creating that atmosphere and putting your characters in that atmosphere. If you are not able to create in that atmosphere, the story means nothing. So with these ones, you know, I always wanted to create that atmosphere of Istanbul, losing not only its time and also its face. That, that space that's facing, uh, losing its face. And here's another very beautiful metaphor about time in your book, which I believe discovered, and I discovered it because of the Catalan translator. He, is, he knows, yeah, we have to point out that, that he knows Turkish and it is a direct uh, translation for Turkish, and he really didn't make this kind of domestication that translation where everything is adapted to what we know about the world, but he used some words that are directly from Turkish, and one of these words is the, I don't know how to pronounce it, but is the bread you eat with this simit? Simit. So that is a circular bread, it's like a normal bread that we have here, but it's together, circular. And that's what it, 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 your protagonist is eating that in, in a park, and I needed to know what simit it is, and when I saw the form of it, I said, of course, that is the example of this circularity of time, because the protagonist uh, is caught in a time which he, he can't lose, because this reality is always there. He can't go back, not back, not forwards. But it is also, uh, I believe here, uh, a reflection about what modernity is. You will remember uh, Angelus Novus from uh, Walter Benjamin, uh, he, this metaphor of a, a, an angel who is looking backwards and he can see ruins and he can see all the destruction that, that, uh, that modernity provoked, but can't stop because the, the wind of progress is uh, is in his wings, so he is going further and further. And that is the main lesson of modernity was, to progress, you have to forget. To be a nation, as Renan said in his Sorbonne lecture from the end of the 19th century, nation means to forget together. But in your lesson, you say, to be able to build a better world, you have to remember. Is it right? Uh, in general, for <laughs> myself as a writer, yes, I agree with it. My old protagonists in my novels, I think, agree with me, except Boratin in this novel. I think he is going on kind of blade. He believes that he needs his past in order you know, to build up his personality or his persona again, because he lost his memory, he doesn't remember anything, and everybody is trying to make him remember things. And then at some point he says that, after one of his friends says that, why are you trying to remember? Okay, you are free now. Past means burden, okay? Don't remember anything, just build up a new feature from zero start. 
And then he starts to think about it. Because when we say past, is, or does the past really belong to us? The past means, for example, I was born in a small village. I, did, I didn't choose it because my parents were there. I grew up with Kurdish. I didn't choose it. My parents were speaking Kurdish. Then I had to study in Turkish. It was not my choice because the states said that this is compulsory language. So all the things I got, actually, the things that given to me by the society, I became myself now after I got everything from the society that you know, I found myself in. So in the end, we cannot say that I am free, or I was free in the society. Very much like, you know, Walter Benjamin, you know, stated there. But now, if you forget everything, that means at least you have a knowledge. You don't have memory, but still you have a knowledge. You know what's reading, what's writing, what's history. You remember some books. And now you have a chance to build up your future. That's, that's great opportunity. That's what my protagonist at some point start to think about. Thank you so much, very, in, very interesting. Uh, I would now start to ask you about space, yeah? to make a, 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 a further step. Uh, and it's very related to what you just said. Uh, this story of Boratin remembers very much um, Kafka stories in one very particular point that there is no home, no intimacy, no private matters. Because uh, Boratin, even when he's alone, he's never actually alone. Because all the others, they know much more about him than himself. And it's somehow this feeling of the decision about my life are taken by others. And this is what Kafka also in theory sometimes explains his diaries about small cultures or small languages, small literatures, that uh, the matter of an individual is in the same, uh, uh, in parallel, in the same moment, also a matter of the whole culture, because there is no public matters. All the matters are public matters. So uh, uh, in this, uh, searching himself, is Buratin also trying to be a subject of his own life again? So not to be defined by others as oppressed cultures usually are, but to decide who I am by myself. Uh, now, there are two kinds of memory, uh, they say, the personal memory and also social memory. The thing that we remember, 99% are social memory. Uh, we know so many things together. We remember, you know, through the book Second World War, or Spanish Civil War, uh, or American movies, or the work at Penn International, everything, you know, on social media, on newspapers. They are all part of our social common memory. Our personal memory is very little part of it. So we have to see where the freedom starts. And also, at that uh, part, we, we should realize that the power or the governments getting involved with the memory, because they always like to build our memory from the start. Every power or every leadership, if they want to invade our future, before that, they have to invade our past. Otherwise, they cannot convince us. So every politician plays with history, with the past. They distort it, they change it. So when people like us in this society think about our life in this you know, actual daily activities, we should realize that we are surrounded by some forces, newspapers, journalists, you know, all these movie makers, fashion designers. So freedom is something collective today. If I, I'd like to be free in my, you know, being the real owner of my, my memory, I have to confront this social memory or the manipulators of this memory. That's why, for example, now 
this vaccine discussion all around the world, or this uh, debate about immigration. Suddenly, everybody forgot uh, history. You know, 80 years ago, old Europe would migrate towards Middle East, run away from uh, Mussolini or Nazis, and now people are moving from that part to this side, uh, but nobody would like to think about you know the past, not long past, but the recent past, and compare two situations, because at some point, our view very much cornered, and uh, we cannot see you know this side and this side. We just see this side. We say, okay, this is good and this is bad. There is no gray zone. Mm -hmm. But the gray zone all around, and that's the reality. That's not something bad. And for that, we need to read books. We need to discuss with open-minded people. And also, we have a good feeling of always being suspicious about politicians. <laughs> that's true. Thank you, Burham. Uh, the other very uh, funny thing I discovered about this book is that the protagonist was born in a village that does not exist. So I went to the Google Maps and tried to find the name of it. How is Nehirce or how you Nehirce? So it does not exist. I thought it was the name uh, of your home village, and I was terribly disappointed because it does not exist. Uh, and that is again the, the question: What happens with space? Because you invented spaces that do not exist, that is really imaginary home village. And on the other hand, we have, for example, the simulacra of uh, reality, like uh, the shopping malls, the commercial centers in the middle of Istanbul, where nobody has his shadow, you say. Uh, so uh, this is a central reflection about space uh, in the novel, is about beauty. And you say, said in other interviews that you understand beauty not as some, an aesthetical value, but, but a political attitude. Because something that is beautiful can't be false, can't be harm, harmful, can't oblige us to forget or to be insensitive. Because beauty has other reasons to be there. What, what kind of reasons, Burham? <laughs> okay. Uh, I have to apologize to Tolstoy because he doesn't like that concept of beauty in art. He is very much of the, um, let's say, ethical sense of literature, but thanks to other thinkers like Schiller, you know, they were very much in favor of uh, the definition of beauty in art. Um, especially today in our life, especially in relation with that novel, because it's about the city of Istanbul, a city of, you know, Imagine 17 million, and you cannot find a small part to go around in your neighborhood. Everything just construction building, just for money. That means a city has been stolen from us for big companies by our, you know, voted government, and they want us just to watch. The city is losing its face and its beauty as well. Uh, that means at that point, the beauty is not impartial anymore. I don't know, maybe in the past there was a moment that it was impartial, maybe never happened something like this. But especially today, it's also part of memory. Now, a government says that this is in history was beautiful, this was ugly. The other group says no, this was beautiful, this was ugly. And it's all defining our current day. The city, the memory, and also our relationship. The way we react to each other. For example, social media relationship is a new sign of modernity. 15 or 20 years ago, we didn't have such thing. Twitter was invented or came into life in 2006. Just a very new concept. Uh, I cannot say about you know, other cultures, but in Turkey, if you are on Twitter, that means you have to be rude, you have to fight, you have to be angry. 80% is like this. Was it like this in the society all the time? It was opposite when I was little. 
And now they say that this is the reality, this is the beauty. And also this is something that you have to accept. Or we should decline it, to change it. Because art sometimes, to build up something, but like Romantic said in 18th or 19th century, Romanticism was good in that sense, because they started by rejecting the current existence. They said, if you don't reject this, you cannot create something better or more beautiful. Today, I think we are at the same point. We need to reject so many things. Yeah, I, I, I really was able, thanks to this Nehirche that was uh, trying to find on the maps, Google Maps, then I found a hotel in Istanbul with that name. I also found that the translation of it is uh, near the river or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, but all, all the languages I speak, uh, Google Translator translated like this. And then I started to go through all these streets to see where this hotel was. And suddenly I was in, in, in the middle of this Istanbul that is not postcard anymore, that is not beautiful anymore, but it's only just very ugly buildings and very empty streets. And then I understood your novel in just a different way. So that there was real Istanbul that you were talking about and not this beautiful uh, touristic panorama veduta that we usually imagine. But uh, one of the, uh, another, uh, reflection you make, uh, it's even a title of one of the chapters, is how to get home, not in the same street at always, but to find another, uh, another path. Uh, and here I think we could talk about uh, how to make us think things that we are not used to see or that we are not used to think. How to think about why I think the way I think, why I have these priorities and not the other ones. So how we are uh, enslaved inside the language itself, no? because it makes us go home always on the same street. And then you have to stop and say, I can go actually behind the block and discover another p panorama. Was that also one of your intentions in the book? Uh, yes, I think this is uh, one of the main problems um, in our life. Um, the difference, I grew up in a small village, a village of 50 homes, Village means everyone knows each other. The main difference between village and city, city means you live with people that you don't know. So you have to prepare for different things, different accents, colors, attitude, you know, or traditions, or, you know, angers. Because in, in the village you know who is, you know, bad-tempered, you know, who has soft manner, but in the village, on the street, Anyone could be anything, a murderer or a saint. So here, now, if this life brings us, you know, all those different options in big cities, it's an opportunity. That means I can make myself available for everyone. They should see me and I should be prepared to see other people. That's why today this anti-immigrant policy or um, strict nationalist borderline policy is against our humanity, against history, and against time. It's impossible. It's just, you know, the policy of the age, as it happened about 100 years ago in 1920s and 30s. Now we are repeating every 100 years maybe, uh, but in the end, we have to see that the real, um, not the reality, uh, maybe the better option for us, the other way, you know. I cannot say that the better option will always succeed or prevail. It's impossible. We can, the history is not optimistic, it's always neutral. If you would like to see a better future, we have to make something for it. Otherwise, it will not be good. It will not happen uh, without our uh, effort no? to, to change things. You have in, in, in the novel also um, a motive of Michelangelo Pietà, uh, that is a small uh, souvenir brought from some, somebody brought it into the house. And the, your protagonist all the time thinks about that figure somehow. 
even in the way that would be in front of the real Michelangelo's uh, sculpture with all his beauty. And then there is a young woman begging on the street uh, with a child in her arms, uh, which is not seen by anybody. So we have this difference between a culture that is historical monument of beauty of culture, which is Michelangelo today. Nobody thinks about what we are seeing. We just see uh, a work of art. And then another uh, real person on the street, which is not seen and which is probably just an uncomfortable present to everybody and everybody would prefer not to see her. I suppose this parallelism is, very, you put it very consciously there. Um, you know, if you walk, you know, around these streets every day for five years, ten years, more or less, 90%, you will always see the same things. Sometimes, in order to be able to see new things, you need to forget the things that you see. So, in the novel, the protagonist gets that chance, because he lost his memory, and suddenly he realizes that there is a souvenir of Pieta at home. He says that, oh, was it here? And he starts to look at him, and then his friend says that, hey, this has been here for years, you never you know, focused it. You never you know, show any interest in that Pieta, why is it now? Maybe because now there is an open space in his memory. Uh, Losing memory and also gaining new things or new places for new memories is another question here. That's why we have to think about it. We have to find new ways for us. Thank you, Burham. If you agree, I would leave now your novel on site and start to talk a little bit also about your work as an activist and as a president of Penn International. Uh, if I'm not wrong, you were elected uh, on the Centenary Congress, virtual one, in 2021, last year. Uh, and uh, we have here this beautiful book uh, called The Illustrated History of Penn International. Uh, that uh, there, Here are 100 years of uh, an organization which is active today in more than 100 uh, places, in more than 100 uh, 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 state or countries uh, all over the world. How do you feel being on the head of that organization? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, you know, we've been in the organization for many years together, you know, with friends here. Um, first, it is a pride, you know, the thing that you feel, uh, but it's um, a very short moment. Then you see this, the real angel uh, then you feel that actually it's responsibility. Mm -hmm. you know? um, for example, sometimes we succeed very good things. For example, we manage to help some writers to be released from prison. You say, oh, great. Then suddenly you get the information of other hundred writers or journalists are in prison or being murdered or they need your help. So the work is uh, or the things that should be done is much bigger than the good news that you receive every day. Uh, let me give you just one example. In February, for a whole month, for four weeks, um, like a secret operation, we worked to rescue one writer from Ukraine, sorry, from uh, Uganda. He, he couldn't flee. In the end, we managed to get him to Kenya. We found a secure place for him. Then we got help from some European countries, diplomats. And uh, first attempt, couldn't manage to get off uh, Kenya. Second attempt, after one month, on the third attempt, it was midnight, I got the news that he's free. His plane now just landed uh, at the airport. So we were so happy. It lasted 24 hours exactly. Then we received the news of war in Ukraine. So the problem or the thing uh, you always carry with yourself is much bigger. Okay, I can say with our actions or activities we managed in my country, in Turkey, um, many writers and journalists 
to be released from prison and to go to Europe to find a safer place. But always I remember that there are 12 journalists in Eritrea being in prison more than 20 years. We couldn't get not only any success, even no news. That 12 people always a bigger issue than the success of 1,000 writers. That's something you should be proud, but you should always keep this with yourself. I, I remember my first Congress of Pan International in Kyrgyzstan, the Sale uh, from Eritrea was just, it was his first Congress too, and he said he's, he was in Norway, and he heard uh, that the train was late and that the train station was saying, the train will be 10 minutes late. And they, he thought in Norway, they told you, they tell you that the train is 10 minutes late and I, for my friends, I don't know where they are for 20 years. And that was really for me a very shocking experience. Still now it is how different the places can be from one part of the world to another. But I, I suppose that for you is, uh, is also very important what happens with Turkey. Not only not today, but in the history, Turkey was one of the uh, points where Pan International was quite active because it's a complicated country, if I may say. And in your novel, uh, Labyrinth, uh, you added at the end the timeline of some dates. Uh, very interesting. Everybody should start reading the novel maybe with that but backstage, not to know what it's about. It starts 60,000 years ago with the first inscription about Anatolia. Then you mention uh, the invention of Clepsydra, of the watch by Platon, uh, and Library of Alexandria, and also, as we said, Michelangelo's Pietà. But there are very precise uh, information of, about Turkey, too. So you explained that in uh, 1960, there was the first coup d'etat uh, by, the, uh, by the military to get rid of the, a very authoritarian government. Then in 71, we have the second coup, uh, which was to stop progressive uh, um, movements influenced by the 69. So that was very different. And then in the 80s, uh, 90, uh, 1980, is the third, the definitive one, uh, which was supported by NATO and where this Cold War strategy started with extreme violence, with imprisonment, with torture. So there was a very well-known trip in the 80s by Harold Pinter and Otto Miller, who went to uh, Istanbul in March. Uh, 1985, and they were uh, they were first received by the American ambassador, and then they were thrown out from American embassy. And Pinter said he was that the, the one of the facts he's most proud of his life. Uh, but Turkey is today still a country uh, with a le really elevated level of oppression, and yourself also, you were, uh, you experienced this extreme violence against yourself, uh, but you write about beauty. So why, what can literature really uh, do to change the political oppression, to break uh, to, to, uh, this lack of freedom? Um. Turkey's biggest um, poet, Nazım Hikmet, uh, he lived in 20th century, spent I think about 30 years in prison, then he died in exile, a kind of Shakespeare of Turkish language. When he was a little boy, uh, his mother was dating with the most famous poet of the time. This little um, Nazim Hikmet was jealous of that man because he was dating with his mother. And at some point he told that man, he said that, I'm writing poetry like you. And the great poem, poet, he said, oh really, can you bring uh, one of your poems? He said, okay, I've got something, I can read it to you. He says, this poem is about my cat. I say, okay. And the poem goes like, my cat is a lion. He can roar, he can jump, he can you know, kill 20 
you know, beast at the same time. And then poet says, oh, no, I, I wonder, I'd like to see your cat actually, what it looks like, bring. And then he goes out to the garden, he brings the cat. The cat is very skinny, dirty, you know, even couldn't move. And this old man says that, yes, that's the poetry. <laughs> Thank you, Murham. <Mura. laughs> That's a very, very good story. <laughs> and uh, I also wanted to ask you for a comment about um, this fact that uh, Pinta wrote uh, two plays, re uh, plays related to his trip to, uh, to Turkey. The first one well known was one for the road about torture. And then the second, which is probably not so well known, by, but I discovered it's even translated into Catalan, uh, is Mountain Language. Uh, that is a very short play, only 25 minutes uh, uh, on stage, uh, where Pinta is speaking about mountain language as a language of the, those who th speak a language which is not useful. It's from the mountains. Of course, he refers here also to the Kurds. And uh, he said in that time, in the 80s, uh, I quote him, uh, quite simply, that they are not allowed, really, allowed to exist at all, and also, and certainly not allowed to speak their language. So what happened in that play is there are different um, uh, protagonists, but one of them is an old lady, a mother of one of the prisoners, who does not speak any lang other language than the mountain language, and she cannot communicate with uh, her son because it's not allowed. And then at the end, at the uh, last scene, the guard says to the prisoner that now his mother can speak with him in the mountain language because they change, they've changed the rules. She can speak until further notice. That says the guard and the mother does not speak. She is mute. I have the impression, Burham, that you write for those who are mute, who stayed mute because it's not possible to speak just until further notice. When Arthur Miller and um, Harold Pinter visited Turkey uh, after the military coup, and by the way, Arthur Miller was um, our president at some point in 1960s, and he did great things uh, for saving writers in prison. And when they came to Turkey, they had chance to see another country. But for a writer, seeing another reality means writing another reality too. And Harold Pinter wrote those two plays, and the mountain language is about Kurds. Because in Turkey, my mother tongue officially described as mountain Turkish. And the official discourse by army in 1930 started. They said that Kurds are not a nation. They are Turkish tribes. Actually, they lived on snowy top of mountains. They, when they were work, uh, walking on that frozen snow, you know, it makes sound kurt, 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 kurt. Then they started to call themselves kurt, kurt, kurt. Actually, they are Turk. They are mountainous Turk, and their language is mountainous Turkish, but a bit changed. And when Harald Pinter heard that story, he got the idea. And also the stories he used here actually happened in reality. I have to tell this part to you. The woman who can't speak with his son at the prison visit happened after military quiz, famous story, unfortunately. Um, the son was a communist like one million youngsters in 1980s. They were tortured, arrested. His name is Kamber Atesh. When families visit them, they are not allowed to speak in mother tongue. It's forbidden. But the problem is, mother doesn't speak Turkish. And after four or five years, for the first time, when she received that permission to visit her son, she goes and she learns only one word in Turkish. In Turkish is one word, how are you? And because that's the only thing she can say in Turkish. For half an hour, one hour, 
the length of all visit, she always says, Kamber Atesh, how are you? Kamber Atesh, how are you? And then it was written by many writers in different books and by Pinter. And unfortunately, mother died last month in Turkey. There was so many new stories written about this. But in the end, okay, it's painful. Um, when I was at the primary school, uh, in the village or in the town, uh, kids at school were forbidden to speak Kurdish. We had the head of class always. I don't know whether you have that practice here. Uh, kind of chair of uh, class, you know, informing naughty kids to teach uh, mm -hmm. during the break time. And they would write the name of kids who spoke Kurdish and which words they pronounced, and then they would be punished by teacher. That's been a practice for 100 years. And still, in many places, that's the policy. Even though they say Kurdish language is not free, we got two or three uh, Kurdish publishing house. But in reality, that's the problem of Kurdish issue in Turkey. And that's why Harald Pinter, people like him, when they write, then we see that this is the real nature of the uh, issue. It's not only a political issue, it's uh, the issue of your existence, you know, your connection with life, with your mother. Because for a child, I wrote about it uh, somewhere, when we suck milk from our mother's breast, on one part we get milk, on the other part we get her tongue. And then they say that you cannot speak this tongue. In every language I know, I don't know, in Catalan, Spanish, the mother tongue is like in English mother tongue, in Turkish mother tongue, in Kurdish, it's not mother tongue. It's called the tongue that you learned when you were in your mother's womb. That means it doesn't come with the birth. It starts before the birth because the culture is something continuous. It comes from history, history, history. This is something we all together created. But then someone comes, they deny. You have survived this, you know, during Franco. Other people survived similar things. So in the end, that's why, you know, literature is a great opportunity for us. Rather than establishing a party for this kind of problems, writing a play like Harald Pinter did is much more important for us. Thank you, Wurham, for all these words. Uh, I would now ask uh, Carlos Tourné, uh, who edited this beautiful book, to speak, if, uh, with your permission, a bit about how this book was done and also about 100 years of Fen Catalan. Thank you, Simona. And uh, let's say that it's a day of joy. We celebrated 100 years of Pen International last year. And today, we celebrate a hundred years of Catalan pen. And it's really a moment of, of celebration for all of us who are connected to this tradition, especially in a culture like Catalan culture where repression has made continuity so difficult. So a hundred years of continuous commitment in pen is very important. And I think as a way of celebrating, I want to show you the last picture in the book. It's this picture, and Burhan is in the center. So we are celebrating that we have been together with Burhan for years. If you don't see the picture too much in the, in the back, it's not a problem, because the importance in this picture is not what you see, but it's what you don't see. Because if you see the picture, it's just a group of writers in a field of snow. Because with Burhan, with uh, 18 pen centers, with three Penn International Presidents, we were in front of Silibri Prison in January 2017 when 150, 150 journalists were imprisoned. And in the moment when we were going to read our statement in front of the cameras of the Norwegian TV, at that moment a track uh, with mil military uh, soldiers and uh, anti-riot police appeared and Burhan was negotiating with them and finally we could take a picture and read our statement but not 
without, with the prison in our back. So it's just we're in front of the prison and behind us there is only a field of snow and here we read, I'm saying this because it's a continuous 100 years of commitment in defense of freedom of expression. Penn was founded by, in London on 5th October 21. Then French Penn was founded in Paris in January 22. And on 19th April, New York Penn and Barcelona Penn were founded on, on, on that day. And there is another picture in the book which is very nice, which is the Penn Congress in 1923, the first Penn International Congress. And in that picture, we can see the delegates of this first Congress. And for us Catalans, it's very nice because we see, as the first face we see in that picture, Pompeu Fabra, uh, who was the president of Catalan Penn, and next to him, Josep Millar Raurell. In the book, you will also see the pictures of the Penn Congress in Barcelona in 1935, when we prepared the, the first campaign for a writer in prison, Jacques Roumain, a Haitian uh, writer who was in prison in Haiti. Uh, there are uh, tales about the 1938 Congress in Prague, where Marcel Rodureda and Francesc Trabal uh, proposed, and they got by unanimity, the approval of a resolution condemning the bombing of cities, because there had been in May 38 the bombing of Barcelona, the bombing of schools, libraries, markets, hospitals, and think that today that we have seen these pictures of Mariupol, it's important to remember that we have been committed against the attacks to civil population for so many years. There is a lot of history here, and you can see how after the years of exile where our Writers were welcomed by pen centers in the UK, in France, in the United States, in Mexico, in Chile. Then you can see how uh, uh, we have been contributing ourselves as Catalan writers to Pen International, especially in the field of linguistic rights. There are many pages, many uh, important uh, stories in that, in that book, which is a very nice book, as you can see here in the cover. We have a nice painting by Tapias. This is the English edition of the book. In the Catalan edition, if you, you want to show it, Simona, the cover is by Jaume Plensa. And this is because we have here in the front row, we have uh, Manel Guerrero, who every year has been asking a Catalan artist to contribute to our campaign for writers in prison. So we have donated to Penn International these many artworks for our campaigning uh, internationally. In the Catalan uh, uh, edition, there is a special chapter about the history of uh, Catalan pen. And uh, what is very nice for all of us, and we are really proud of this success, is that there are 14 versions of the book. So it's in English, French, Spanish, uh, Catalan, Basque, in German, in Swedish, but there are also special editions, for example, one in Tibetan uh, language, the last chapter is in Tibetan language. So just to say that uh, for uh, San Jordi, uh, of course, by Labyrinth, by Burhan Salman, but also enjoy this nice uh, story, this 100 years uh, history of connections, of friendships, of commitments of Catalan writers together with uh, our international friends. Thank you. Carlos, thank you so much for this short but very nice explanation about what PEN International is. Uh, Burham, I, I believe you agree that we not only make uh, important things but become friends uh, when we meet on all these uh, places. Uh, so for conclude, I have an, an, a last que question for you. Uh, I would like to ask you about your experience of displacement and belongings. So if I think of other writers, uh, it comes to my mind uh, Paul Celan, the German poet, uh, who uh, be belonged to so many different traditions and languages that I sometimes think nobody can actually know who Celan was because he was from his rural Romania 
to the most erudite circles of uh, Jewish intelligentsia in, uh, in Paris. And everything he was able to cover with just one aim, which was to explain what Nazism was, what is the Nazi terror. And in somehow, I feel that your uh, position is also similar because it seems you are now today representing Penn International, which is a, a really big network of writers and organizations. Uh, you also participate to the, to the global literary history, world literature of today. You said there are more than 40 languages you are translated, you can be read in. And also when we read your books, uh, it's obvious that you know everything about every uh, single writer that, uh, that is important in world history. Today you talk about Einstein and Tolstoy and Kafka and so on. But nevertheless, uh, you know what rural life is very well. Uh, you know what is to be burned and persecuted directly. And you know also how is to come to Istanbul when you are 17 and go out from that beautiful building which does not exist anymore, the Haider Pasha station, and see on the other side of the Bosphorus, Europe, no? on your knees. You have to enter there. So is writing for you also the possibility to put all these identities together? I think this is a question that uh, we are trying to find an answer. Um, at every 10 years in, in my life, I am giving a different answer. <laughs> my opinion changing. Um, as I said, I was born in a small village uh, in the middle of a desert-like place, you know. Then, uh, when I started primary school, my father took the family to a small town nearby. When we were in the town, I missed my small village a lot. We would go to village, you know, every harvest time for four or five months, but still I was missing it. Then, at the age of 17, I went to university to study law in Istanbul. I started to miss my town. Then, I became a lawyer, then I had problem with the government, then I went to Britain in exile for 10 years. Then I started to miss Istanbul. Then I returned to Istanbul. Then I started to miss UK, the place that I'd been in exile. Now. Where is home? People say, okay, your home is Istanbul. Actually, no, my home was the small village of 50 families. You know? Uh, I think this, the question, or maybe the force of modernity, I'd like to, let's say, especially when I, I was in the first years of my exile, it was a painful issue. I was very much, you know, stuck with my past, Istanbul town, village. I can't live without you know, my home places. But now I see this as an advantage. As a writer, I don't believe and I don't want to be part of any borderline of nations, including my own nation. Of course, I want a country for my nation, but then we should be free. Anyone, anyone can go anywhere. Now in Turkey, I don't know how many uh, immigrants you have now here, how many Syrians or you know, Arab immigrants here. In Turkey, we got only Syrians of five million. They all came in the last seven, eight years. Uh, more than one million Afghans, Iranians, Iraqis, about 10 million people came. In Turkey now, it's a fashion, you know, having that feeling of hate about those new people. You know? For myself, it's an advantage. Those people can bring something new that we can change. I'm not talking about our guilt that they are in our country. Because when the United States started war in Iraq, Turkey supported as a member of NATO. When the United States and the UK went to Afghanistan, Turkish army helped them join that operation. And Turkish army still in Syria still invading Kurdish land. Nobody says anything while people criticizing Russia against Ukraine. 
And now Turkish people say that we don't want Syrians. You deserve it on a political way. But on a literary way for myself, I say that this is uh, an opportunity. Because you come from Slovenia. You are from Catalonia, but in Spain, but in Europe. That's I come why from, I am asking you. Yeah, I, I'm, coming from, I'm coming from a Kurdish village. I live in England now. We are all at the same time, you know, in, in a the single table, we represent about 10 countries. You cannot force me to go back that small village anymore. No one can do it. No one. And I don't have a right to push someone else to go back somewhere, you know, that uh, they should go. In the end, this world, let, shall we say about uh, how, how old is it? four billion or five billion years old, it belongs to everyone. You know, Syrian, Afghan, Kurd, Catalan, or Jew, or black, white, doesn't matter. Anyone has right to live anywhere. If someone against it, that means we have to start to worry at that moment. Thank you, Burkham, for these words. Maybe we can stop here now uh, with this beautiful uh, idea of belonging, everybody belongs to this world. But I would like to invite the audience, if you have any questions to Burham, uh, or any other questions. At the back. Yeah, at the back. Yeah. <laughs> En primer lloc, molt content de que tornem a tenir aquí l'autor quan ja va presentar... Només un segon perquè es posi les, la traducció. Yes. Doncs molt content de que estigui aquí, que ara recordo quan va venir a presentar la, la seva anterior novel·la. Eh, jo li volia preguntar per una qüestió sobre la creació, sobre la, la seva darrera novel·la i la creació. És la següent. Eh, si no ho tinc mal entès, parla d'una persona amnèsica, que va, per un accident pateix d'amnèsia. És clar, quan eh, en un moment com el nostre completament marcats per la ciència, no? la la medicina, no? un llenguatge absolutament científic, eh, no li va fer respecte fer una obra creativa pensant que potser des de la medicina o des de la versant, versant més científica li podrien dir que certs passatges són inversemblants des del punt de vista científic? Uh, I hope I understood well uh, your question. I will try to say a few things. If I'm wrong, please correct me. Um, of course, I'm scared of uh, science. Um, because science is, okay, it's good. We have to trust it. But in the end, it's open to be misused. Uh, especially when we see the, all these social media things. It's not just a place that we are having fun, you know, sharing some photos. It's shaping our life, you know, like uh, Cambridge Analytica uh, issue. Trump won the election with the uh, company called Cambridge Analytica because they manipulated all information on Facebook. Facebook means that we are just enjoying seeing or sharing some news. So science is part of science at the same time. And all these are being used by whom? By me, by you, by us, by corporations, by governments? That's question mark. I don't want to give the answer. Everyone can have another answer. But it, we should ask this question. We should say that, OK, this is not impartial, because in the end, it's affecting my memory. 
And the way that I'm looking at other people, seeing other people, uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, in the United States they had a small experiment uh, on the followers of Fox TV, you know, pro-Trump or right-wing TV. They asked them not to watch Fox TV, instead watching some other, let's say, uh, progressive TV channel. And after a month, they realized that so many people started to change their view on cer certain issues. Because they are being bombarded all the time by certain manipulated, let's say, information or news. That's why at that moment, if you want to have a peaceful and equal memory and equal future for all humanity, we have to be very suspicious about so many things that are going around us. Thank you, Burham. Uh, Manel, here, please. Primera fila, si Thank you very much for your speech. Um, faré la pregunta en català. Eh? Um, després de llegir el llibre, el, el, el protagonista eh, sembla que vulgui saber per què es volia suïcidar. Eh? Sembla que és un, una de les, de les qüestions que, que, que va sortint en tot el llibre, però eh, ni el protagonista ni el lector acaba sabent Quin va ser el motiu d'aquest intent de suïcidi? Eh? Eh, aleshores, eh, per tant, eh, és, és com si en realitat fos una metàfora el llibre, no tant d'un suïcidi, no, sinó una societat que va cap al suïcidi. I en aquest sentit, el fet que sigui un jove de 20 anys que estigui a Istanbul... Eh, Quin, quin, quin tipus de lectura ha, ha tingut la novel·la a, a, a Turquia? És, és, és una reflexió sobre on va Turquia, sobre com és les noves generacions a Turquia. És una reflexió més universal, no? com, com semblen les referències a Borges, no? que estan des de l'inici de la novel·la. Tinc curiositat a, a, a Turquia com, com, com s'ha llegit aquesta novel·la. El laberint és abstracta, però alhora també és d'una persona concreta no? que viu en una societat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think this is my only book that uh, I didn't have any uh, direct political reference. Uh, it's about a blues singer a young, handsome guy who is trying to kill himself and then try to remember things. That's all. Uh, but it turned out to be uh, the most... Uh, it, it had the most reviews in comparison with other books that I published in Turkey. For example, for Labyrinth, if I've got 50 reviews and interviews, for Istanbul, Istanbul, let's say 50 or 60. For Labyrinth, I think it was double, about 100. And um, I got the most invitations for reader groups with Labyrinth. And that was the question I asked myself. I said, why this book? My smallest book, non-political book. But interestingly, all reviews were reading the book with a political you know, eyes. They were trying to read it as an allegory. As if I'm saying this, but the actual thing that he meant is something else. I don't know, maybe it's true or not, but in the end, that also shows the, the soul of current uh, society in Turkey. Everything is being interpreted into politics, unfortunately. This is not good. Politic uh, kind of the monster of our daily life now. Because Islam is somewhere, secular is somewhere, you know, our Kurdish people somewhere, socialist groups somewhere. 
always clash and you cannot see things you know outside that world even you know reading a book or a love story is not a love story any, anymore everything is an allegory and with this book i realized that everybody uh, praised it they said this is the wonderful allegory of current turkey and so many interpretation came in that way even some reviews like let's say in france in united states more or less the same they wanted to see as a political secret language was it my intention i cannot say anything about it i just wanted to write the story of a young man uh, a blues singer that's all and here we have another question Hi, Mohan. To follow a bit on your previous answer, uh, being a scientist myself, I am a little bit worried about what you said. I mean, you don't need science to manipulate people. You can manipulate people with philosophy, with history, with literature, with religion, and that does not make them necessarily bad. So, when asked about science, that your only reply was about the danger of science, uh, I mean, it puts me in a very bad situation. I mean, I think this, this border between literature and science has done a lot of bad uh, consequences in our society. And so I think it will be nice not to judge science by its misuse, um, as we don't judge literature because of its mid, um, bad use. And so, for me, science is just the opportunity to know much better what we are. And with all, without a basic knowledge, a scientific knowledge of what human beings are, you cannot, in my view, in the present century, to make a philosophy or a personal vision of humanity. So, just a few words to ask for the pride of science and uh, not judge it just because of its... But we can discuss about that another day. Uh, thank you, Jordi. Uh, I had privilege of reading Jordi's wonderful manuscript, not published as a book yet, about uh, theory of science, something, a, a very short philosophical book, I think, when is being published, it will be a kind of historical book, um, because we discuss about it a lot. I agree with you in that uh, sense, you know, science cannot blame. I didn't, I meant that science is being misused. So our job, or not job, okay, our ethical responsibility to save literature, to save the beauty of Istanbul from bad guys, you know, that's horrible powers, and also to protect science as well. Science sh shouldn't be left to, let's say, Elon Musk, someone, I don't know how and why he is going to use all this power, but it should be used by people like Jordi or, you know, other young people. And uh, at that moment, you know, science, literature, art, architecture, they are all on the same level for our future. If we like to create a better future, that means we cannot say that this will save us, literature will save us, or science will save us. If we don't manage to bring all of them together, none of them will be successful in the short term. Of course, in the long term, we, don't, uh, we, don't, we know that uh, Galileo couldn't say when he was tried at the court, He's, he didn't say that the world is rotating, you know, that's famous discussion. But the reality that it's re rotating, and now everybody says that it's rotating. So we are repeating what Galileo found, but he couldn't uh, pronounce it at the time. And today, that means we have to say the world is rotating through literature, through art, through beauty, through science as well. Thank you, Jordan. I'm afraid we don't have much time uh, because at nine we have to be out of here. So if it's a very short question, you can do it. 
<laughs> Hello, good, good evening. It's been an honor to, to be here tonight. And my question is about the, the Pen International. I would like to, to know or if, yeah, I would like to know two or three proposals, commitments or objectives the Pen International have at the moment. Uh, thank you very much. In general, maybe um, I have to give some information about, okay, we are 100 years old, but um, it was a difficult 100 years. Uh, in general, I can say we have two main pr uh, principles. One is uh, promoting literature and writers, and secondly, uh, defending freedom of expression. But these are not simple definitions. That means lots of work. Uh, especially defending freedom of expression means fighting governments, you know, uh, fighting for freedom of writers in prison uh, in Mexico or in Russia when journalists are being assassinated. That means try to protect other journalists who haven't been murdered yet. All those things, you know, big work. But uh, these are the main lines. Apart from those main lines, we've got you know, countless things. For example, we have Translation and Language Rights Committee. Simona was its chair for many years, and Carlos worked for it many years. We have a committee called Women Writers uh, Committee. We have Writers for Peace Committee. All those uh, committees, you know, uh, have history of 50, 60 years. And they are the, doing great things. For example, the Writers for Peace Committee is organizing its annual meeting in two weeks' times in Slovenia. And we are going to meet there. Uh, every time we are organizing different things. And nowadays our main issue became war in Ukraine because very much we are very much like everyone worried for our colleagues in Ukraine and in Russia. Before that, it was Afghanistan. Only in Afghanistan so far, we rescued 75 writers and their family members. Still, there are writers that are waiting for our help in Afghanistan, in Myanmar. We rescued some friends, but still there are some friends waiting for our help. This is our work, our mission. It's not only just uh, being proud that we are writing beautiful books. Uh, when you look at our list of, uh, you know, presidents or vice presidents, uh, at the moment our president emeritus uh, Mario Vargas Llosa or vice president Margaret Atwood or Ram Pamuk Svatlana Alexievich, they're here at Penn International uh, not only for their books. They would like to use the power of their pen for writers who are not able to write, who don't have that opportunity in Eritrea, in Uganda, in Turkey, even in Italy, in UK, in so many places, don't think that, okay, Europe is lucky. Not actually. So many cases at the moment we are following. In every country, the freedom of expression is under attack. Just today, British court approved the decision that Julian Assange should be deported to the United States. I'm a lawyer. This is totally against human rights, against the basic rules of British law itself. We know that it's a political decision made between UK government and USA government against freedom of expression. These things are all our work, our work, our work. Of course, we are uh, most of the time at home, just sitting at table writing some beautiful stories. But when we are writing this, we are always having other names in our mind you know, to remember them. Thank you. This was a very convenient question to end the evening. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for everybody to be here with us, for your attention, especially, Burhan, thank you for everything you said today. Thank you, Simona. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.